So here's the thing. My kind of feeling these days is that nonprofits aren't going out in the world talking to new people. So here's an honest question. I want you to be honest. Now, not, I know not everyone here is from a nonprofit, but I'm going to assume you all are, just for the sake of my sort of thing. Um, who? I want you to sit down if you had less than five conversations with new people this week. People you didn't know. Ten. And this week is early. In this the week, week ten right. conversations week. with people. The calendar week. Let's say it's a calendar week. So, <laughs> like, what is it today? Tuesday? Is it, so, Tuesday? Is it Tuesday? Wednesday to Wednesday to. Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. This guy. See? There's good things in community. Um, all right, so 10. We're at 10, right? So 15. That's pretty impressive. Look around the room right now. These people are like super connectors. They are doing the work that all of us in nonprofit have to do by going out and meeting new people and having new conversations with people. Because quite frankly, if you're not doing that, your nonprofit's not going to survive. And you know what I say? Good riddance. Because you're cluttering the scene. And there's not enough dough to go around. Why don't you can sit down? <laughs> That's a bit harsh, I know, sorry about that. But really, it, it, it's like one of the things I've been doing for the last five months is meeting all these different nonprofit leaders. And when I talk about this concept of, well, who, who, how are you finding new supporters? Or if you're a political party, how are you finding new supporters? And it's a blank stare. Like that, you're not you're not going to survive. Your mission isn't as good as you think it is if you're not finding new people. And you actually actively have to pursue them. Oh wait, forgot something, forgot something, forgot something. So I got these six sheets here. If, if you guys could just like put your name on here, I kind of want to spam you later. So, <laughs> I just want to send you all sorts of junk. Um, just like, uh, just put your name and then someone at the end of the table just like hold them. Not like all crazy crap. Nothing you're interested in. <laughs> just put your name down. That'd be great. Just do it, man. I'm doing that. Just put your name. Yeah, I'm gonna send. What you? I know. Yeah, I'm gonna send you all sorts of stuff you don't want. You know, I know all sorts of stuff you don't want. <laughs> so are we done that? Oh, you're not doing it, man. Jack, come on, come on. You let me down. Who's not doing it? Oh yeah, we're doing it. Read your name, but you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it. Are we all done? Done? Every table done? Opal, are you ready for the? You're going to be in charge of the list, okay? Okay, well, you, 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 can you get it? Yeah. Sharia, are you, you're in charge of the list there. Nate, you're in charge of the list for your table. You're, you're in charge of the list. Jack, can you be in charge of your list? Oh, it's just going around? Okay. Well, whoever's got the list, kind of, can you, at this point, can you just stand up and, like, hold it for me so I can come get it? Okay, we've got one, two. We got any more lists? Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. We got some more lists. Well, that one's kind of, it's taking a while. Okay, hold up that list. Can you guys tear it up? <laughs> and can you stomp on it? Stomp on it. I would never spam you, first of all, but the thing is, is do you guys engage in cellular technology? Can everyone hold up their cell phones? If you have a cell phone, please follow the instructions here. Text hashtag net2van to that number. And then you are going to get spammed. No, I, 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 why would I spam you? You wouldn't listen anyways. You know? If anyone's spamming, stop that. It doesn't work.
I so, type so fast. <laughs> yeah, did anyone type so fast? Are we good? No, you. Like I said, you're like one word, you got like three sentences. Yeah, no, I'm quick. I'm quick. I operate quickly. <laughs> um, so could you imagine if you were at, um, who uses Eventbrite? And it's, a good, it's good, right? Like it's, it's good for what it is. One of the challenges I always had at Pivot when we used Eventbrite is we couldn't get plus ones. We didn't really know who was bringing who. Um, people would just show up. So we used to have this fundraiser um, called Passion for Justice. I don't know if anyone's been to it. It's a great time. You should go. Hendrick's been there. Every year. Um, it's a great time. And what we started doing once we used Nation Builder was exactly what I just did. Hold up your cell phone. Text duh, to this number. All the plus ones in your Nation Builder database immediately. What we could also do... <coughs> If I wanted to get a sense, so just by a show of hands, who here works for a nonprofit? Okay. Who works in housing? Anyone? Anyone? One, sort of. So what we can do with this is this is in Nation Builder, this is called text keyword. So I could have set the text keywords for like labor, housing, union, whatever it is. Everyone in this group who's interested in politics, text politics to this number and it would have segmented you by that, by what you were interested in. I, I was at the Progress Summit recently, and I did that in a room full of 250 people, and within three minutes, we had a read of the room. Based on the forecast, I mean, it's a bit, you know, we set up the categories, but if you're at one of your events with your supporters, whether it's like, I mean, the sign-up sheet is dead. That was the metaphor. I don't know if you didn't get that, but that was the metaphor. The sign-up sheet's dead. If you're at a nonprofit fundraiser and you're using a sign-up sheet, come forward. Come forward. Um, not to say that lots of nonprofits don't do that. We did that pivot. Even though we had an issue with it, we did that. And it, it just, you know, you do what you can. You do it with the capacity that you have. But these tools are here, and they're not going to blow your budget. Any questions about that? Any? Did anyone get through to the message? Yes, I'm not going to spam you. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, this is me in 2009. Um, I took over Pivot in 2010. I had no fucking clue what I was doing. I was really scared. The founder of Pivot um, decided to leave, and he asked me if I wanted to take over. Quite frankly, to be totally honest, part of the reason I did is because I'm like, if I don't, who will, and then will I still have a job? Um, and I realized pretty quickly that what I needed to do at Pivot was change the culture of leadership that was happening in the organization. But there was a little bit of a problem with that. This was my concept of leadership. <laughs> so, before I worked at Pivot, Pivot was my first real job. I worked there for nine years. I mean, you know, it's okay. I studied Soviet history for 10 years. And my concept of leadership was leadership that was <laughs> but this kind of leadership, you know, the great person theory of leadership, the person who drives people to action. Um, and I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be able to do that at Pivot. I was like, yeah, I don't think that's really for me. Um, so how am I going to do this? Luckily, right around that time, I went to a place called Hollyhock. Has anyone been to Hollyhock? One. She really, Hollyhock's a good place. I, I totally recommend it. Um, and I went to a course called Art of Leadership. And we spent a lot of time focused on what was your own style of leadership. What did you look like as a leader? And I realized that for a lot of years, I'd been kind of struggling with this concept of leadership that looks like this, or you know, presidential in the United States, or whatever. There's so many versions of this. This just happens to be my weird version. But I, I didn't know exactly where I fit in it. And after our leadership, I started looking at this photo quite differently. So you, you know, for those of you who don't know Soviet history, you have Lenin up here and you have Trotsky here. In the Stalin's version of the photo, he's not there. 
He's just, it's just a blank spot. But um, in this version, he's there. But what I started seeing is that there were tons of different leaders in this photo. That Trotsky was a leader, that the people who got the people to this place were leaders. And so I started thinking about leadership quite differently. And at my first staff retreat um, <laughs> at Pivot, I brought this photo. And I put these, for each staff member, all nine of them, um, I put their face there and my face there. And I said, look, we're going to move from a command and control structure to a distributed, organized, networked structure. And I'm going to create the conditions for your success, but I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not a lawyer, first of all. Like, that makes it really tough. Like, let's name the elephant in the room. This is weird. Um, but also, I, I don't know how. And I can't do it. I'm not going to try to run it all through me. Because that's how we kind of got in this problem in the first place. So the thing I didn't mention is my first job at Pivot, day one, was walking around to creditors asking them to forgive $400,000. Yeah, that, I forgot to mention that. That was a tough day one. It worked. Most of them forgave the credit. Anyways, whatever. Long story. Um, so a lot of the thinking that I got from that I, that I applied to Pivot at that time came from Web of Change. So Web of Change is another Hollyhock program, um, and I happened to go to something they put on um, in 2009 in Toronto called Social Tech Training. It was focused on technology, but what I, like, just like everything that tech, everything that's focused on technology, it's not about the tech. It's not about the tech. You know, it's not about Nation Builder or, or Salesforce or City CRM, sorry, Eli. You know, it's not about tech conferences. It's actually kind of about what you do with the tools that matter. Okay, so what they said at social tech training in 2009 was that organizations that are successful, organizations that are winning, are organizations that are bringing the values of the internet into their structure. Networked, transparent, democratic, okay? So I started thinking about how could I do this I pivot. So we went from a very command and control structure to a structure more like this. I, I held a central position in that like, I kept made sure that everything was happening. But I certainly didn't control everything. I was on a phone call yesterday with a, a very big nonprofit we all know, national nonprofit, really important nonprofit, especially this year. And uh, we're talking about they were hiring someone new. And we got into like 99% of the hiring done. And they were all having doubts, with the 1% left. We we're talking about the doubts, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. I was like, guys, you know what? You're hiring a new person, it means letting go of control. But if you don't let go of control, you are not going to survive. Because control can only get you so far. That's how I felt at Pivot. Pivot is a, is a great idea. It's a great concept. It attracted incredible donors. Huge community of donors really quickly. But it could only go so far in a command and control structure. Um, this is a pivot team about a week before I left. When I, so as I said, when I started pivot, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, um, had to downsize. That was another job I had, um, letting people go. Uh, moving from four thousand square feet to seven hundred square feet, like all those types of things. Um, when I left four years later, we had four thousand four hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Our revenue had doubled. We had double the staff we had. And we had more success in the courtroom than we'd ever had previously. So this kind of did a weird thing to me, is it just made me like a bit emboldened in my like vision. I was just like, yeah, no, that was good. That was right. That was right. So now I kind of like go around to rooms like this and talk about this thing. Is because I actually think that for nonprofits to succeed, they need to really alter their culture. 
towards a distributed model. One of the interesting pieces of this is along this journey of altering our culture, we implement a nation builder. Now, nation builder, when I started using nation builder in 2012, it was a shadow of what it is now. It was there was no API. It was a very limited program, and it's grown with a major focus on development to be a very, very robust platform. But one of the great things about Nation Builder is it pushes you as organizations towards those values of the internet, towards transparency, towards democratizing your culture. I'm not going to say that it will democratize your culture, but it will certainly encourage it. And that's what it did for us. When, uh, uh, you know, I, my last year at Pivot, I was, you know, we had had this success, and I was like, well, what am I going to do? I was doing talks like this, and I was like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to have these conversations when you're in an organization. And so I started thinking, well, how could I do more of this? And it was about that time um, that Nation Builder called me and said, hey, we're thinking of opening an office in Vancouver. Uh, would you would you be interested in coming to Los Angeles to talk to us? I was like, well, that's not really how I roll. Like, I don't know. I just don't fly. I don't know. I just, it's like, I've been on a plane before, but like, I just don't, I don't know. I just like, don't. They, it was the next weekend or something like that, so I wasn't sure. Before I go on, though, I'm just going to pause there and just ask if there's any questions, because we're going to kind of switch into a different piece of this story. But I want to know if there's any questions right there. So, other than uh, Pivot, what other nonprofits have you worked for? So, none. Pivot was my first and only job. But, um, <laughs> no, that's, I, I, that's true. Um, but um, I have, I worked as a consultant for many years, just kind of off the side of my desk, with particularly. So, at Pivot, I was, um, I was the operations director, then I was comms and development, then I was the EV. So, when I was comms and development, I worked for uh, a number of nonprofits in Vancouver. Um, including the BCCLA, Megaphone, um, the Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS, just doing this type of work, fundraising and, and communications mostly. Yeah. But other than like that, other than, I also work for labor unions doing the same thing. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? That's David Lewis in the middle of that. Yeah. Did yeah. it work for you? It didn't work for us. No, no, sorry, but you know, he was not on the team. Yeah, that was a lunch we had with them. Yeah, that's a lunch. Good. Good. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So, so Nation Builder calls me and they say, oh, do you want to come to LA? And as I said, I was like, I live on Bowen Island, like, I don't know, Los Angeles. This is kind of like, really? Like, okay, I don't know. So I talked to my list of advisors. I have a list of advisors that I talk to about big decisions. I think everyone should have a list of advisors. They're all older than me. And I was like, should I go? And they're like, yeah, you should totally go. Just go, you know, just see what it's like. So I go down to Los Angeles, and um, I am, I'm like kind of cocky. Like, I'm just kind of like, I'm not, I didn't shave my beard. It was like this big. I like wore a hat the whole time. There were other people there like in suits. So I was just like, whatever. Like, I was just, it was ridiculous. I was like the absolute like Bowen Islander, like what is this place? Like I was just like, no, you know, this is not gonna work. Like I'm not a tech guy, like there's nothing you can I've got a great job, great people, like, no. So I go down and um and I, I think in my head I'm like, oh man, if they start talking about technology to me, I'm out of here. Like I'm I'm just done. Like I'm standing up, I'm getting on the bus and going to Santa Monica. Um but that didn't happen. And this is kind of what they talked about. So I took these slides exactly from a presentation that Nation Builder gave to 25 of us that went down um, to work in field offices all around North America. So he started with this idea that there was an old world that was collapsing. I immediately this resonated with me because I working at Pivot for as long as I had. It was super clear to me that there was a system that was gasping, 
Like it was gasping for its last breath, but I couldn't name it. I, I just couldn't really name what it was. And, and if you look around us, it's kind of happening everywhere. There's crumbling systems and major opportunities springing up. So they started with this concept of the old world, which they call limited community and factory creation model. Controlled by gatekeepers and really rigid. And this slide killed me. Apparently this is the CEO, the CEO's favorite slide. He's like, this is the factory model on your life. So who here can relate to this? Who can relate? So let me tell you, I could definitely relate. I definitely related with the red bar. The red bar really resonated with me. Student loans, grad school, like, God. Um, all of these things. And here was how you survived in the old world, which again, like, resonated with me deeply. I finished grad school in Toronto. I mean, granted, I studied Soviet history, I and mean, who does that, right? Like, there's just no way you're going to get a job out of that. But, like, I studied, I finished grad school, and I came back to Vancouver, and I couldn't get a job. I was like, what the hell? Like, went to good schools, did all right. Like, and I remember just, like, rocking on the floor for, like, six months. Like, what the, how do you get a job in this town? I mean, it didn't help that I was writing cover letters that had, like, pictures of Stalin and talked about, like, all kinds of You know, back in the day, I was using some weird Mac that I didn't say it, like, it was, like, distressed. Um, I wish I had those cover letters now, because they were fucking ridiculous. Um, but, but that's, like, I mean, I couldn't get a job. And so I started volunteering at Pivot, and lo and behold, that was my first job, and it worked out. But this really resonated with me. All of this stuff. And they contrasted it with the new world, which is a world of infinite community. A world where you can connect to people without going through a gatekeeper. I mean, who here remembers checking the TV Times, I think it was called, to see what was on TV? Come on, I know you all, I know there's more of you out there. I, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm 40, so it's like, I remember. My son, who's six, will never know that reality. Never know that there was ever a thing called TV Guide. Because TV's on all the time, whatever he wants to watch. That's the new world. No gatekeepers holding us back from what it is we want to do. This is Nation Builder's community creation model. What do you think is the hardest thing on this list? Shout it out, popcorn stock. Give me one. Who says the first one, hands up? Second? Third? Story. Fourth? Fifth? Yeah. It's not that hard. Um, yeah, I think the first one too, actually. You know, that for me, I mean, there's other things that are hard telling stories. Are, they're all hard. You know, and that's the thing about technology. Like, beware of the technologist who tells you it's, you know, all you gotta do is have a nation builder and it's gonna do it all for you. That is not the case. This is the hard work. You know, nation builder gives you the the structure to do it all in. And, and it allows you to scale it. But all of these things are hard. And quite frankly, like, when I'm like going out and meeting nonprofits, and I say to them, so what, my first question, so if anyone wants to meet with me after, you know I'm gonna ask you this question. What do you want people to do? To me, that relates to this question. And if you can't answer that, like that's, that's step one. Don't ever invest in technology if you can't answer that question. Don't sign up for Nation Builder. Don't go and get someone to build you CV CRM. And certainly don't get Salesforce if you can't answer that question. But here's the thing. It's out there. 
And there's tons of people who are interested in the thing you're doing, and they're waiting for you. They're actually waiting for you to come and connect with them. One of the things that I, well, what do people think of this? Any feedback on this? Popcorn style. Anyone? Anyone? It's a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be alive. Who said that? The technology is here. The future is here. Totally. When I was young, I used to really like want the TV phones, you know, TV phones. I was like, when's that going to happen? And then it just kind of happened. But it wasn't like the way we thought it was going to happen. Like, you know, the old rotary phone, there'd just be a screen there. No, it's like now in your pocket. Anyways, the future's here. Um, yeah, one of the things that I struggle with about this, about nation builder generally, and about technology and all these things, is that envision a world where everyone has the freedom and opportunity. And it's hard. How do you, how do you make sense of that when you've worked at Pivot Legal Society or when you've worked in developing countries? And I, I don't have the perfect answer for that, but what I've started to think is that like us as a community in this room actually have a responsibility to do this because we can. Um, and this is what Nation Builder does: is it is an infrastructure for a world of creators. Whatever it is that you want to create, <coughs> Nation Builder can help you do it. Whether you're a small business, I love small businesses. <laughs> as customers at Nation Builder because it's there's so much value. And and small business kind of get it. Like they get the whole like let's go out and find new people thing. Whereas like nonprofits tend to be a bit more like, I don't know about that. Um, small business will go out and do that and I love it. Um, if you're a nonprofit, I mean in my research and tell me if I'm wrong, um, there's three things that nonprofits want. Money people, and action. Is there anything else? Like, I've been saying this for a few weeks now. Just let me know if there's anything else. Yeah? Nation Builder can do all those things. And if you're a political party, you generally want money, votes, volunteers, or anything else. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Action, yeah. It, right, votes, or, okay. So, these are the fundamental beliefs of Nation Builder. Everything that Nation Builder is is reflected in these core beliefs. Um, and I, I like again, like going back to when I was in LA, and they're like, "Oh, we're like they never talked about technology. This is what they talked about, and this is actually what they believe. They, it is a it is a business." But it's like a social mission business that's like driven to create creators, and that's where the profits go. So there's a huge focus on development. All right. Any questions about that? What we just went through. No? So we look. I did a little bit of that text keyword thing. So for me, that's. As I was mentioning earlier, it's kind of a game-changing technology. There's a number of places you can think to use that. A couple other things that Nation Builder does that is a, like top tier and that other systems don't do um, is a deep social media integration. When I was at Pivot, one of my favorite searches, filters, in fact, like my all-time favorite filter, was when we were looking for donations at Christmas, we would search with this criteria. Had donated, had RSVP, and had retweeted us. When you put those, that list together and made those calls, you were, we were almost guaranteed 100% return on those calls. Because there was no one who, especially if they retweeted you recently, they were not gonna not donate. I mentioned earlier about Pivot's passion for justice fundraiser. So when I took it over in 2010, it was kind of rocky. Our goal had always been to make $10,000 off it. That was the goal, 
I think the first year I took it over, it was three. It was five. Then it went back down to three. And I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't want to think about the money anymore. I just want it to be a good time. I just want to have a, I want people to come out and have a good time. So we did that. The first year we had Nation Builder, we did that. What happened was I pushed the staff really hard to sell tickets, and they did. And because Nation Builder had the event, like the event was through Nation Builder, all of those ticket sales were new people coming into Nation Builder. So our events in November, we have this amazing event, like the, the lawyers are like dressing up as like Justin Timberlake doing weird stuff. Um, with this amazing event, people go home. Three weeks later, we call them for a Christmas appeal. Our Christmas appeal went up by $5,000 that year. And that's what started happening. We stopped caring about the money. We are like, this is not about the money. We'll just have a good time. But because everything was flowing through Nation Builder, when it came to the Christmas calls, so our Christmas appeal went like that. The funny thing was, it started making 10000 bucks. I can't really explain that. I have no idea why. It just did. But when I left in 2014, last year, when I started the Christmas appeal, it was about twenty grand. When I left last year, it was forty-five. And I think that part of the whole thing that we have to be doing as nonprofits is giving people a good time so that they can feel inspired to give when you ask for it, instead of always asking for it. Um, Nation Builder, this is from the website, it, it's built as the first operating system for community, so the idea is to put all these things together um, that a community would need. And it's very basic, Nation Builder is a people database that houses deep profiles on your people with social media integration. So, for example, I heard of Eli, but I never met him. And I looked in, uh, Nation Builder runs off Nation Builder, so I looked in our nation before we, we were going to go have a coffee. And I saw a picture because it pulls in your social media avatars. So all of a sudden I knew what Eli looked like. So when I went to Lost and Found Cafe, I wasn't like, you know, who are you? And you know, it was easy. The whole point of that is, is not to make your, your coffees easier, although it's a nice um, benefit. It's that like people are more than email addresses. When, when we stop thinking about building lists and we start thinking about building relationships, that's how our nonprofits grow. Um, people database, real power of Nation Builder. Finances, I mean, all the typical stuff you would do with finances. Um, payment processors, we don't have IX yet, but it means to find we're trying to do that and make it happen. Um, communications, it does email text blast, um, which is top tier in Canada. That I keep pushing all my friends who are running advocacy organizations to do text blast because no no one's done it yet. So it's like if you do it you're at like the cutting edge of technology like today. Political parties are on it, but no uh, no advocacy organizations yet. And then website. That's one of the the things that people often misunderstand about Nation Builder. It actually is a website too. It is your website connected to a database. And the idea is it's not like a database like I often think about databases as like a bag you reach into and pull out the things. Whereas Nation Builder is much more like an action portal. It's like you're setting up all these actions that people can take, usually volunteer, give money, or take action. And they do that, and their profiles get filled out in your database. So I just want to show you a little bit about what, I was, what I've been doing recently. Can everyone see that? It's kind of small. So a couple of weeks ago, I was like lying on my couch Bowen Island watching the Canucks game. It's a boring game. You know, they already were going to be in the playoffs. And um, I was like, you know, I'd really love to have like a progressive universe in Nation Builder. So one of the things you can do with Nation Builder is you can import anyone's Twitter followers. So I can import anyone's Twitter followers. I can't do anything with them except have them in my database. But, like, I, I mean, I can't email them, and I can't even direct message them, but I can have them. So what I did is I, I made a list of 95 of the leading progressives in Vancouver, and I imported all their Twitter followers in the course of two hours. By the end of the day, because it took a while to get them all in, 
I had 1.1 million people in my database, all who were following leading progressives. So that's what Canada looks like. Those are the Twitter followers of these leading progressives in Canada. And, and again, this is 95 people that I thought of, just like while I was watching a Canucks game. Okay, like there was no science to this at all. So for example, well you can see at the top it's 210,000 people. And these aren't, these aren't like your, you know, your everyday people, these are people that are following leading progressives and who are on Twitter. And Twitter tends to be, oh, so Twitter is 20% of the Canadian population, educated, disposable income, middle class. The exact demographic that supports all your organizations. Okay. So then, I did a further search. It's, it's, sorry, it's hard to see. But basically what it says at the top is the primary address is Canada. In the Twitter bio, it contains the word activist. So you can search Twitter bios. And then is not following the Broadbent Institute. I just grabbed like a think tank and I was like, okay, they have a lot of followers. So you can see that's what Canada looks like. Those are the, those are the people who self-identify as activists in my little sliver of people I imported. So everyone? Yeah. So let's like take a look at what BC looks like. So that's BC. It's 544 people with the in their bio, activist. So I'm just going to leave you with a question. There's 210,000 people who are following leading progressives in Canada. There's 544 of them in British Columbia who have the word activist in their, in their uh, Twitter box. Have you reached out to them? Are they supporting your organization? And how are we going to get them? Thank you. So, we have time for questions. Anyone want to start this off? Otherwise, I'll just push you and do it. But I think Someone from this community to do it. Hey, Chad in the back. I have a question. So, uh, my CRM makes me want to slit my wrist. So just in terms of like, you know, if I wanted to like play around with Nation Builder thing, like how would I start? Do I need to make a friend with somebody? Do I have to import them on Twitter? Or is there like a, hey, nonprofit person here is your 30 day, feel free to kick the tire sort of thing. Like wh where would I start? Totally, that's a great question. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's a 14 day free trial. You go to nationbuilder.com, um, it's right at the top of the website. Um, that's the easiest way, for sure. Um, you can call me too, and uh, I mean, half, like, three days a week, I'm, I'm meeting with nonprofits talking about, like, what your goals are and how you do it. Jack? We uh, launched our new website on Nation Builder. Uh, and then we started pushing some social media buttons. We had up to 7,000 contacts in the last few weeks. And your first question to me when I was bragging to you about it was, well, you got your email? And, nah, it's all Twitter. So what do I do next? Yeah. That's a great question. So, um, actually, I was going to write a blog post about this just because so many people have been asking me that question. But my um, colleague, Mike Michella, who spent 10 years organizing in the Democratic Party, got to it before me. Um, so if you search on Twitter, at Nation Builder, I think yesterday he put it out. So what you do, so, what they're, so basically I didn't come up with this idea, you know, watching the Canucks game. It was an idea stole from a Democratic organizer in the States. So in the States, there's um, what's called Democratic Twitter on Nation Builder, and they have 10 million uh, people, activists, basically, in their... In their uh, in their nation. So what they're doing is they're using bio searches and, and, and basically really fine tuning with tags. So we saw that tag before those broadband. So for example, let's say that I still worked at Pivot and I was a digital organizer at Pivot. So 
Pivot is a legal organization. So I would import the Twitter followers of all the other legal organizations I could think about. And I would search who are in Vancouver who are following the BCCLA, for example, the British Columbia Civil Liberties, and are not following Pivot. And I would get that list really finite, and then I would do a sponsored tweet to them. And the sponsored tweet is, um, and you need, you need a landing that they will, that will convert them. So it's not donate, obviously, it's probably not come to an event, maybe petition, maybe something softer. Um, but in the States and in Canada, for the people who are using this tactic, it's a 25% conversion rate. So when you think of the economy of scale, I mean, that's at economies of scale. Like if you're doing really targeted, like I'm this organization, I'm gonna, I mean, I've had people call me and say, hey, I wanna set up a Twitter nation for just the followers of our competitors. And I'm like, well, I don't think that's a great idea. They're like, nope, that's what I wanna do. I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know, if it's that targeted, you're probably gonna have higher than 25% conversion. But at a massive scale, it's 25% conversion with sponsored tweets. Yeah. What's the best tool you've found for buying from a board? I'm kind of pushing yeah. all our web stuff, yeah. and our executive director and GM, or well, why do we need this? Like, what, what we have yeah. working now. Is it? No, I know that, but they yeah. don't know that, and I am not sure, so. Yeah, no, that's totally right. Um, I, I did, it, I did this talk, a similar talk at uh, the Can Roots in Toronto, and someone asked me that same question. And I, I, I said I fucking hate boards, like that's how I started, but I know, I know that's just, like, just not functional. Like I know that's not getting us anywhere, so I'm not going to say that to you, although I kind of said it. Um, although Kendrick was on my board for many years. It was a good board member. Um, <laughs> um, how do you get more by it? What are the things that nonprofits care about? Money, people, and action. You know what? Let's not bullshit. They only care about money. Okay? So, and it's not, I'm not to say that nonprofits don't have a social impact. Of course they do. We all know that. Like, let's not even, let's not even consider that a piece of the puzzle, right? What a nonprofit, especially a board, wants is money. Because they don't ever want to make the tough hard, terrible decisions to lay people off, right? So from my perspective, um, as an ED who had a 13, 14 member board, they include the founder of the organization, and you know, it was a tough board. Lawyers, tough board. Um, money, that's the key. So if you, uh, if you want to talk about framing up, I'm super happy to, um, super happy to connect. Practical question, just in terms of um, nation builder specialists now in Canada. When okay. we last looked at it, it was uh, go to LA, go to wherever to deal with the certified right. person. Yeah. And uh, my clients want someone on site yeah, here sure. and totally. do all the, the turnover. What, what's happened now? Totally. Um, well, we I know we have at least one nation builder architect in the room. Um, we. So when I came back, I had to go to LA for two months for training, and then I came back here in November, and the first thing I did is I called all the web people I knew, like all the design studios, and I was like, you gotta become a nation builder architect, because I knew that if we didn't have the, the ecosystem, if we didn't have the infrastructure, it wasn't gonna work. So there's a number of great architects in the city and in the country, um, but they're, yeah, and I'm super happy to connect after and, and, and give you their names, but it, it's a, it's amazing how many great design studios who were doing WordPress or Drupal or whatever it was have now added Nation Builder. Yeah. What is the what's the time frame for a nonprofit to to get familiar with Nation Builder to get everybody like from like the top ED to like maybe the managers and the frontline people totally. to Nation Builder? Um, so uh, it's a great question. It kind of depends on the size. How many people are we talking about? Um, so basically, I'm, like, I'm from uh, it's the street festival, right? Oh, yeah. Probably running a huge street festival on Main Street commercial. Cool, right? yeah. And also um, um, West End every yeah. year. Yeah. And we have like a, a small team of people. Yeah. So, like, we host huge parties, right? Totally. And so basically, um, I've been advocating the idea of 
like leaving like Google Docs, which they've been using for the last like four years, and like uh -huh. chaotic, right? Uh -huh. And we're considering like either Salesforce, and I've been talking about nation but it's probably more appropriate. Yeah. And but they were concerned about oh, it may take a long time to get started, and the festival is coming in about two months from now, so mm. we don't know like do we have time to move it on to nation builder for this year, so we have to really push it until next year. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? Um, Edward. Edward. Um, Edward, like, totally honest. I'm not sure I would move with two months before a festival. Like, totally honest. Um, just because, you know what, it's about three weeks is, like, kind of what I'd say. It's three weeks from the day, like, you have buy-in to the day, like, you're totally operational, depending on your web stuff. The web is always the harder part. Like, if you have to design a new website, um, obviously that takes longer. But from a data perspective, it's very quick because we have a data services team that will, like, take your... Um, stuff and and translate it into our stuff and it's it's quite easy. But honestly, if I was like your ED and you came to me two months before the festival, I probably would say no, just because it seems too risky and I would be risk averse. That's my take. But totally happy to talk later about like what that might look like for your nonprofit. But it's gen. I had someone ask me that question today. It's about three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my question is around uh, mostly privacy for two perspectives. One sure. is around PIPA or PETA or yeah. PIPA compliance yeah. for being hosted on British Columbian soil. Right. And the second one is in the post 9-11 world of the U.S. Patriot Act. Right. The U.S. government has a habit now of issuing national security letters for American companies, which would be demanding, say, Nation Builder, provide them access to all of, all of your customers' information and under a gag order so that the customers so I'm just curious what your perspective on is on that uh, for people who have sensitive databases such as political or activists, as well as people trying to comply with BC or federal privacy. Yeah, totally. Um, so the data is hosted in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I pushed our CEO about having Canadian data services or servers, and said it'd basically be one million dollars to set up and hundred thousand dollars a year to to operate. Um, so he, he's just like, that's not going to happen soon. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a little, and this is my bias, but I'm a bit dismissive of the Patriot Act stuff. Um, totally like willing to defer to anyone who has more knowledge than me. But my feeling is, and I was talking to a data security guy yesterday about this, and, he's just, and my feeling is if the NSA wants your stuff, they're going to get your stuff. And actually, some people have said that it's more secure to be in the US because the NSA actually spies more on foreign powers. Now, your stuff about gag order and all of that, that's all true. I mean, I don't really, I mean, you have the same issue when you're with Salesforce, MailChimp, Eventbrite. I mean, you just, you know, TechSoup, it goes on, right? So, uh, quite frankly, My thing at Pivot, sometimes people bring this up to me, was like, I want to win. You know, I go forward. I take the tools that work best. And if like the NSA comes calling because we have like 5,000 activists in our database, well, then we deal with that when it comes. You know, I, it's not a great answer, but that's my answer. That's my perspective, as you asked for. You're required to notify your clients of your apps. Yeah. I have no idea, Jack. No. You know, that's because the new regulation just being passed, you can't disclose any fact that you've been asked for that letter, and you disclose you're potentially likely to be arrested by, or prosecuted by the Americans anyway for that. There is some debate whether that's legal. Um, it's going through the courts at the moment, apparently. And, and Australia has gone so far as to make warrant areas legal. Yeah, yeah. So that was the thing. Yeah. Keep I mean, what I would say to you, if you're really concerned about that, go support open media. You know, go support the organizations that are like fighting these battles. Um, it is like the the world we live in right now. It's it's related to that uh, question. Uh, thank you for that question. The question that I was first going to ask. Um, my concern would be, you know, if this was hacked by a three-letter agency or they were doing it, not just that they could get the data, but they could use the system inappropriately. So my question is, what safeguards does 
do you have in place to make sure that when messages are going out to all these things that they're actually being delivered? You know, what, what sort of processes around that? Because if I was evil, what I would do is hack into the university and I would use it for my purposes. And what are your purposes? You, 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 <laughs> <laughs> my purposes are good purposes, but good. not everyone has my purposes. Totally. Um, so all I can, I, I don't know the details of that, all I can tell you is that when I've asked that question, it's like top tier data security. I mean, obviously, the business is data, right? Like, the business is data. So one thing is, is if Eli has a nation, and I just go into it without his, like, express permission, I'm fired. It, they take it that serious. It, it is, the, they understand it. The tech, the tech platform, is a thing, it's like tools and all that, but the real business is the data. So it is the number one thing, it's where they put all the money. It's, uh, I mean that, there's one slide I took out of uh, the slides I was showing today, which showed the business model, it was like more for an internal audience, but it, it basically shows the business model as like, revenue equals more development equals more, customers equals more change equals more, you know, like it, and that's their thing. It's like money to development, money to tech, so that people can go out in the world and, and create the communities they want in a secure way. That's all I can really say. I mean, I'm happy to like dig into it more with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I have put those questions to some people because obviously they come up. Do you have a follow? Uh, I do, just quickly, um, that there is a model that gives you sort of the best of both worlds. And I really, really encourage you to look at it. And that is sure, provide a host to see those people, but also open source it and let people install it and put it under the compliance and their own control on their own hardware, all of those things, right? You get the best of both worlds. Totally. And that's, that's I mean, the yeah. Best. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously a huge debate, and I'm like totally willing to debate you that point uh, for nonprofits over beers, because I, uh, I, I have some pretty strong. Uh, opinions about open source and just what it means for winning and delivering on your mission. Um, just to, you can still do the self hosting company in open source too. Totally. You could, I mean, you can say yeah, prize I get it. The self hosting thing, I'm yeah. a big one in the with yeah. Katie Long. Totally. Sure, I have a question. So, nation builder community focus. That resonates with me. So, say I'm a nation builder customer, where do I find you? my community? Where do I find my peers of people who are struggling with this, trying to figure out how to make it work within the context uh -huh. of the organization? Uh -huh. I feel like that was a softball. Yeah. You're like, hey, hey, tell me something. Um, so one of the things we've been trying to do, um, we've had a uh, Nation Builder Labor um, get together uh, on Thursday morning. I'm hosting uh, what's called like a REACH uh, seminar for five very uh, carefully selected Nonprofits that have already been using Nation Builder, and we kind of identify who could grow to a next level if if they had like some actual one on one on one time and it, within within a group context. So we're trying to do a bunch of these things. I mean, I'll be honest with you, Eli. Um, the demand is is pretty huge right now, and um, we're pretty bursting at the seams. So we're trying to figure out how we can best create those community spaces. Um, yeah, we're we're trying. So yeah, that's the live place. What about like online forums? Are there, totally. are there other equivalent kinds yeah, of places? For sure. So absolutely. Um, there's a Nation Builder Facebook group, uh, which I think is just um, well, if you just look up Nation Builder, you'll find there's a yeah, I think it's the only Facebook group actually. There used to be like sort of a company one, and now they turned it into a community one. Uh, a lot of people are sharing um, Nation Builder jobs there. So there's a Nation Builder Experts program, which people can. Uh, sign up to do, it's free, you walk through all these steps, you become an expert. There's tons of work out there right now for Nation Builder experts. I get calls every single day, people asking me, How, who can help me with Nation Builder? Who can, who can come to my you know, office and do this? Uh, so there's a Facebook group, um, tons of advice and things are being passed along there. Um, and then, I, I mean, I, I tend to, whenever I'm like, there's a few, like there's a number of design shops that have set up. Uh, blogs and different sort of solutions for Nation Builder online. So if you like Google Nation Builder, you find them. Or if you're having a problem with Nation Builder, like I'm often Googling like 
how to share tags, Nation Builder, and you find, like, I'll find the Nation Builder stuff, but then I'll find all this other stuff as well. So there's a big, like, community online. Sweet. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I just So as your question. So the question yeah. is, is that typical starting is almost needed because of the way nonprofits are measured. Yeah. And do you know any success stories of people who've gotten away from that other than pivot? We or, or any suggestions as to where people can go to try and change that because it seems to be a huge issue of stunning block for nonprofits. Yeah. The board the structure and yeah. the measurement structure as opposed to yeah. the money structure. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the nonprofit business model is challenged for sure in the in the board situation. Um, I think also nonprofits have operated in it for a long time in a, in a, a somewhat of like a concept of scarcity, and and rightfully so. I mean, there is there is scarce resources. Um, so that I think as a result, a lot of nonprofits become very risk averse, right? And I, I get it. Like I ran a nonprofit, you, I was risk averse lots of the time. Um, but I would say that there's a tier of nonprofits um, that are sort of enterprising in their own way um, that are challenging the nonprofit model to with some success and some failure. Um, you know, pivot. Pivot almost failed in about 2009. We, we started a social enterprise, it failed. You know, um, classic social enterprise was feeding, or was sucking from the parent nonprofit. It's ridiculous. But I think what's super important is if you're in a nonprofit and you have one source of funding or you have an institutional funder, it seems like a good deal at the time, but it's actually not at all. It is an absolute vulnerability. Because, you know, in a, in a legal nonprofit that was the Law Foundation, that was the central funder. Well, the Law Foundation funded based off the interest rates that lawyers were collecting, and we all know what's happened to interest rates over the last 15 years. The Law Foundation has no money left. So all these organizations are funded by the Law Foundation. They're pretty much like, like those are the people who are in my office saying, how do we, um, how do we like do this thing, like engage people and stuff? Like we've never done it. And I'm honestly, in my head, I'm like, hmm, I think it might be time to pack up shop. Like, you know, that's what I'm thinking, but then I say, oh, well, this is how you do it, right? Some of them will survive, lots of them won't. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but, yeah. Can I just give you, like, a quick yes, no's, or checklist? Like, I'll say, can I do this? And you say, yes. Yes. Or no. Yes. <laughs> can I segment my audience? Yes. Can I email that segment? Of course. Can I tell if they open it? Yes. Can I tell if they actually clicked it and did what I wanted them to? Of course you can. Can they pay money online for the website integration? You, these questions are too easy. Yes. Okay. Dude, these are my problems. <laughs> <laughs> Your problems are easy. Okay, good. Yeah. So you got any more? Anyone else got problems? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you have a castle. I have a castle? Castle, yeah, yeah. Canadian, uh, blah, blah, castle, blah. Castle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, it's expensive totally. in Northern. Yeah, so uh, Nation Builder is castle compliant. They made those changes after castle was released. Um, I mean, I first, I first, the first thing I ever talked about with castle, and it came from a legal organization we dealt with castle, is first, I think, uh, foremost, you should get a legal opinion. Like, that's number one. Get a legal opinion on your operations. Are you actually bound by castle? That there's so much misinformation about Castle. Um, are you a charity, first of all? If you're a charity, then chances are most of your activities are not bound by Castle. If you're the only thing that is that is regulated by Castle is commercial electronic messages, CEMs as they call them. And they don't count the CEMs if it is 
funding the main goals of the charity. So, but I'm not a lawyer, so go get a legal opinion. But, but nine out of ten nonprofits they talk to, charities in particular, are not. They they think Castle is worse than it is for them. But otherwise, uh, regardless, Nation Builders Castle compliant. And anyways, beyond Castle, fuck the federal government. It's like you should be asking people for their permission anyways. You're not going to get donors or volunteers or anyone to do anything if you're spamming them. That's the worst. Sure. Um, just want to clarify something. So, is Nation Builder a donor database? Yes. Or, okay. Um, but could you have Nation Builder as, as a platform to get more engagement yes. while you're still having your... Totally. Yeah. That's a great question. So, there's a number of nonprofits like the one you work for that's been around for a long time that maybe use Razor's Edge or Salesforce or something like that. Um, Nation Builder fits really well on top of those systems to be like uh, events, email, social media integration. I sort of, when I, when I meet with nonprofits to talk about that, I don't try, like I'm never gonna try to convince someone to come off Razor's Edge to go to Nation Builder. Like, I just don't want those phone calls. You know, like, <laughs> I do not want those phone calls. Um, but what I talk about is like, it's an amazing engagement hub on top of that database. Because it's not as, uh, it is for sure, it's not as robust as race percentage. Yeah. What about an, uh, analytic tools, in like both uh, in, in built inside of Nation Builder and then external tools uh, like some, uh, Power BI or Tableau? Or yeah, totally. Like um, so it has like built in Google Analytics, obviously. Um, beyond that, I'm not really sure. I have, like, it's not, it's not a huge question that I get very often, so I'd have to like dig in. <laughs> Pricing change between private and nonprofit sector? Same no, way? all the same. Okay. Yeah. We're making a film with a nonprofit, and uh, our whole film is about engaging and giving them a voice right, in a process that they've been shut out of. Um, and what we want most of all is a place where our content can stay, so clips from the film, and also a place where people can start to submit and put on our site actually uh, how they're affected by this uh, by this government process that we're, that we're studying. So um, my question was just, how easy, it, easy is it to set up for people to actually like start to interact with your site and actually put on uh, content on your site? Yeah, totally. So Nation Builder was built to be to have like user submitted content. It um, <coughs> Nation Builder came out of the 2008 Obama campaign, and basically the idea was there is like, wow, these tools are amazing, but they cost so much. So let's like make them scalable and make them available to as many people as possible. A huge part of that campaign is this like concept of user submitted. So like for example in your case, um, people can do user submitted blogs. They could do, I mean that's sort of the most um, applicable. I mean there's also user submitted events, user submitted surveys. There's a lot that you can do there. 